Um, I'm going to talk about um, some old stuff, um, building on the photographs I showed you uh, a few minutes ago on the Low Isles um, uh, expedition. So I'm going to ask the question, what can older scientific studies and older evidence in general um, tell us um, about the Great Barrier Reef today? In particular, how has the Great Barrier Reef changed over the last 100 or 200 years? Um, is it still a pristine uh, ecosystem? Uh, that's certainly the perception that many people uh, still have. Um, and in the last uh, election, unfortunately, not only was um, climate change science politicized, but so was the science underpinning the management of the Great Barrier Reef. There was a lot of discussion by fairly ill-informed groups um, about the efficacy of the recent rezoning and about the need for sustained um, management of the Great Barrier Reef. Um, so I'll talk at the end about the implications of, of these shifting baselines for, for coral reef um, management. Um, I'm going to show you lots of old pictures. Um, this is a, a quite an old one. It shows a gentleman called William Savile Kent with his, um, his watch and his pith helmet and his long pants. Um, he was a, a scientist. He wrote a very famous book, which I would urge all of you to look at. It's full of uh, really interesting photographs, like this one. Um, he was a naturalist, but he was also um, hardly a conservationist. He was interested in the exploitation of the Great Barrier Reef, and he wrote a lot about uh, the potential of the Great Barrier Reef um, to provide uh, new fisheries, uh, some of which were emerging uh, at about um, that time. Um, so some of the earliest fisheries uh, on the Great Barrier Reef from the uh, late 1800s onwards were the sea cucumber or bestemir fishery, uh, the trochus shell fishery, uh, and the pearl shell fishery. This is a picture taken by Sir Morris Young in 1928 showing uh, uh, the sorting out of the pearl shells prior to uh, shipping. These were big industries a long time ago. So in 1904, there were five and a half thousand men uh, employed in these uh, uh, interrelated fisheries. Often all three st um, stocks would be collected by uh, one vessel, and there were 830 registered fishing boats um, in these I industries. To varying extents, these industries um, peaked and crashed. Um, the trochus, because of the biology of the snail, has been um, more sustainable, but, but even today it's a, it's a shadow of its former self, and there is effectively no pearl or beche de mer um, fishery um, today. Um, the picture on top taken in 1883, was taken by William Savile Kent. It shows a photograph of an Acropora-dominated reef flat uh, near Bowen, uh, just off the mainland coast of, of Queensland. And the picture on the bottom was taken by um, my friend and colleague David Wackenfeld from the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority. And that shows you uh, an indication of the sorts of change that has happened on many of the fringing coastal reefs um, along the coast of Australia. We've seen what some people refer to as a, a regime shift or a phase shift from a coral-dominated system um, to a system that's much more um, muddy and dominated instead of corals by uh, macroalgae. And uh, later on in this session, Brian Walker will talk about some of the uh, concepts relating to phase shifts and resilience uh, of, of ecosystems. So certainly there have been some change. This, of course, occurred a long time ago, long before modern monitoring and modern uh, management of the Great Barrier Reef was, was initiated. These two photographs come from the Low Isles, taken uh, as part of the Royal Society's um, expedition in 19. 28, 29, and they too show an inshore um, Acropora dominated uh, system at low tide. Um, those of you who've been to the Low Isles today know that it's uh, a much muddier uh, system today. Now it's very difficult to ascertain to what extent these shifts are natural geomorphological shifts occurring at the scale of a good chunk of a century 
or whether they are uh, human related due to uh, runoff of sediments and nutrients. And Malcolm McCulloch will address some of that um, in his talk um, momentarily. Um, one of the things the Lowell uh, expedition did is they, they mapped habitats. Um, so the red area there shows the coverage of mangroves on the Lowells in 1928. And that mapping has been repeated now um, three times. So those different colors show the quite substantial spread of mangroves, quite a significant shift in the habitat structure of the Lowells um, over the last uh, 80 years or so. And here's another way of looking at it. This is a Google Earth map showing the, the reef today, and the red outline um, indicates the extent uh, of mangroves um, in 1928. So certainly there's been uh, a big shift um, on many inshore habitats. If you look in uh, historical archives like the National Library, you'll find lots of photographs um, like this. This is a, a sawfish um, near Cairns, and it was caught sometime in the 1940s. More recently, uh, there's been a huge decline in sawfish that's largely gone unrecorded, uh, particularly, I think, due to the impact of, of netting um, in estuarine and, and nearshore waters. Um, here's some data. Uh, this isn't a, isn't a formal monitoring program. This is based on information which is recorded by people who are licensed to um, uh, manage shark nets. And so the y-axis on this graph is the catch of sharks in shark nets deployed along the east coast of Queensland between Cairns and the Gold Coast uh, between 1962 and 1988. So if we accept the premise that these shark nets are reasonably good sampling devices, then there's been something like a three or four-fold decline in the density of sharks caught in those nets um, over that period. And that decline continues today. Um, dugong is another story of decline. Um, much of this decline occurred before uh, the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park was established, but it has um, continued and it continues today. Um, so the loss of megafauna on the Great Barrier Reef is a big issue that um, has not adequately been uh, addressed. So this uh, set of photographs shows the historical biogeographic range of dugong and much of that range today indicated by the, the blue. Um, this species is more or less ecologically extinct. It's an important species because of its role as uh, a herbivore and the bottom left picture shows the feeding trail, which is very important for the successional dynamics and maintenance of diversity of different seagrass species in these important um, nearshore habitats. There's been something like a 98% decline of dugongs on the lower two thirds of the Great Barrier Reef um, over that um, time period. Um, turtles have also declined. Uh, this is a photograph um, near Mackay. Uh, in 1928, C.M. Young went to um, uh, the Capricorn Bunker Group where there was a turtle factory uh, in operation. Over a period of a few years, that turtle factory harvested 700 turtles as they came ashore um, to nest. Um, more recently, uh, Colin Limpus and his colleagues have uh, devoted their career to following uh, uh, the status of various species of, of turtles on the Great Barrier Reef. And this is one of Colin's graphs showing the decline of uh, female nesting loggerheads in the Capricorn Bunker Group, about a 75% decline between the mid 70s uh, and the late 90s. Um, there are also lots of old photographs of big fish, um, like this one. Uh, being caught by this recreational fisherman who curiously wears a tie. Um, um, so clearly there's been an, a, a historical impact uh, uh, from recreational fishing in you know, the 1900s um, through to today. Um, and all of those shifts have occurred before the establishment of the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park and, and before systematic monitoring began um, uh, by the Australian Institute uh, of, um, of Marine Science. Um, uh, more modern data is, of course, much more 
uh, available and much more rigorous. And this is a, now a very famous slide by um, Gary Russ showing the difference in biomass of Plectropomus, the coral trout, which is the, a prime target for both recreational and commercial line fishing inside uh, green zones or fishing, uh, no fishing reserves compared to blue zones where fishing is allowed um, outside. Um, and most of you will be aware of the recent uh, rezoning of the Great Barrier, which was very much informed by work by Gary and his colleagues uh, on the efficacy of these green zones in terms of rebuilding um, depleted fish stocks. Um, I haven't mentioned crown of thorn starfish, which is another uh, ongoing impact on the reef. Uh, increasingly, coral scientists uh, have been documenting uh, the impacts of climate change. Um, that's not my opinion, that climate change is impacting coral reefs. That's an observable fact. Um, so we've seen bleaching on the Great Barrier Reef uh, at an unprecedented scale in 1998 and again in 2002, and it's only a matter of time before we have more of these uh, bleaching events as the world slowly warms up. Um, all of which, uh, all of this gathering information has served to inform management, and this is, I think, an important uh, quote from the website of the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority uh, in, 19, in, sorry, in 2003, where the authority basically changed its opinion on the status of the Great Barrier Reef. I think it's fair to say, and there are people from Gabrumpa in the audience who can correct me, that uh, prior to this, um, the authority thought it was doing uh, a pretty good job at maintaining a near pristine system. And I think that opinion has shifted not just uh, among the scientists, but also among the reef managers in terms of uh, increased knowledge about the history of the reef and its trajectory, uh, which in many uh, attributes is not a desirable trajectory. Um, so in response to all of this um, gathering information, uh, the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority and other uh, agencies responsible for stewardship of the Great Barrier Reef have done a lot of things, not the least of which is the establishment of the Marine Park uh, in 1976. So there's been a gradual scaling up of management efforts which has been informed by the science. Um, there's been a lot of emphasis on education, uh, on establishing industry codes for tourism and fishing in particular. Uh, there's a permitting system and there's an enforcement system. Um, and education, I see, as part of our role as scientists, and that's part of what we're about here today, um, presenting our science to management agencies and other interested parties. Um, there are a whole set of new fishing regulations. Queensland uh, still doesn't have a recreational fishing license, um, and I think it's time it did. Um, we've also seen 10-year um, targeted water quality plan um, we're now uh, well into that plan. We year eight. Um, someone can inform me on that. Not a lot has happened, uh, in my opinion, in terms of achieving lower targets for, uh, for runoff. I think the big success has been the 2004 uh, rezoning. And you'll hear talks um, later today and tomorrow about the success of that rezoning in rebuilding uh, fish stocks inside the new green zones, which now comprise 33% um, of the Great Barrier Reef compared to 5% um, or so before um, 2004. Um, okay, I'm going to leave, leave it there. Um, many of the points that I've raised in this last slide will be covered um, by the talks um, that follow me. Um, but I would like to make uh, one last point, and that is that this slide here tells a story of constantly evolving management and governance. And uh, we need to resist the temptation to give a big tick to the 2004 rezoning uh, with the attitude that the job of saving the Great Barrier Reef or, or maintaining the status of the Great Barrier Reef is done. It isn't done, and the pressures on it are still growing, and no doubt there will be further 
changes, adaptive governance, if you like, um, to the management of the Great Barrier Reef in the future. Thanks very much.